The scripture reading for this morning is taken from Ezekiel 34, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not the shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool, slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my, shepherd, my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered and become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord said. I'm against the shepherds, and I will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and it will no longer be food for them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As the shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he's with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on the day of, of darkness and clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements of the land. I will tend them in good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. Therefore, there, they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured, strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. As for you, my flock, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will judge between one sheep and another and between the rams and the goats. Is it not enough for you to feed yourself on good pasture? Must you also trample the rest of the pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you muddy the rest with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trampled and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you shove with flank and shoulder, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away. I will save my flock. They will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Great to be with you here. This is how I take holidays. Not very good at it. But um, no, happy to be here bringing you the gospel. Um, I love this passage. I love Ezekiel 34. Just this picture of the good shepherd. And uh, when I was working on this sermon about a month or so ago, I, I happened to be at a meeting at a place called, uh, at the offices of an organization called Safe Families. Just do a plug for that organization. I think y'all, you guys are familiar with Safe Families. I think you support it as a church. It's just a wonderful uh, organization that helps families in crisis, families in need. And so I was at a meeting there, and I don't know if that picture's there. It is. So I was, I was sitting in their office and around this table, and then on the wall is this picture. It was a big picture, and hey, you guys are good. Um, and it's like this grainy image of a guy running for a sheep stuck in the mud. And I'm working on this sermon on Ezekiel 34, and I'm like, 
I'm taking a picture of that. I hope I'm not breaking any copyright laws, but I'm taking a picture of that because that is just such a beautiful artistic description of the good shepherd and of Ezekiel 34. And it's a powerful image. It's an image that you actually see throughout Scripture. Uh, For instance, a lot of you might be familiar with the psalm, Psalm 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, right? Or I lack nothing, right? And just this beautiful picture of of God loving his, loving his sheep and just walking beside David. You know, David just sings a song. Jeremiah 23, another passage. Jeremiah is prophesying to the people of Israel. They're going to be, you know, there's, they're going to go through some tough times. But he's like, but I myself will shepherd you. I will find you. Right? So it's just this, this powerful image. And then Ezekiel's written after both of those. And Ezekiel just builds on that. And then John 10 if you read John 10, we'll, 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 we'll check in on it a little later, but when Jesus speaks of being the good shepherd, it's this image that he's building on. Now, what makes it more beautiful, this image, what makes what Ezekiel is saying, or God saying through Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34, what makes it more powerful is, is what happens when you realize when Ezekiel's saying this and where he's speaking it. So just to give you a bit of, bit of context, Israel was this, this people of God, and they, God had given them this land. They called it Israel, but what happened is Israel had actually rejected God. They had become like all the nations around them. They had become horrible, oppressive, their injustice, like they were sacrificing, doing messed up stuff, you know, like in, involved in worship of other gods. It was ugly, and Israel was all about that, and God's like, in my justice, I cannot have you here. You need to be excised from the land. And so what had happened is, the Lord had raised up this this empire called the Babylonian Empire, and this Babylonian Empire had, had, beginning in 605 BC, had, had conquered Israel and had started deporting the Jewish, especially from the leadership, and putting them in Babylon. And there were two series, there was a series of deportations, one in 604, one in 597 BC. And Ezekiel was part of the exiles, the exilic community living in Babylon. So you have to understand that. Israel has been exiled from the land, from their home. And Ezekiel's ministry is to bring God's word to the people who had been kicked out of their homeland and were now living with the people who had conquered their nation. And Ezekiel was prophesying in the first part of his book about how the temple was going to fall. And a lot of people are like, no, the temple's not going to fall. God's not going to do that. That's God's temple. But what happens is the temple falls. 586 BC, the temple falls. Ezekiel's in Babylon with the exilic community, and he brings this message to them. So you got to understand, the people who this image is being shown to, being proclaimed to, are people who are in exile, who have been undone as a people, and whom God appears to have abandoned. And then Ezekiel brings this message of the shepherd, that God is saying, I am still your shepherd and I'm running for you even now. And so this picture, the good shepherd, is just a picture of God's love. And what we're going to do today is we're going to learn about the love of the good shepherd. And we're going to start with first thing, just looking at his love. We learn from the love of the good shepherd as we see his love for his sheep. And when he says his sheep, he means his people. Now, Ezekiel 34 itself, as you, as, uh, is it John? As John read it, you might, you might have like, just caught, like, there's a lot of judgment in there. God's angry. God's concerned about the leadership, the people who had, who had done harm to his sheep. He's concerned about all of these things. But what you have to understand is when you look at Ezekiel 34, what rings through the entire passage is the love of God for his people, for his sheep, for you. Underneath everything that's said in this chapter, and foundational to it all is his love for his sheep for you. 
You know, judgment's a big part of it. We can go right to the judgment and why and, and then what God's going to do about it. But we need to spend some time at the feet of the good shepherd learning about his love, seeing his love. And what it starts with is that God knows his sheep. He knows you. In verses 4 through 8, if you've if you got a Bible, just turn with me. You can kind of scan through the passage as we talk. In verses 4 through 8, what you really see is God describing the nature and the character of sheep, of his people, right? They are needy. You know, sheep are needy, they're weak, they're defenseless, they're easily injured, they're vulnerable to predators and disease and prone to wander and be led astray. Everything you see in verses 4 through 8 is, is dealing with, I see my sheep, I know their situation. You leaders, you haven't dealt with that, but I know what they're like, I know what they need, I know them. You know, sheep just want to be happy. They want to be eating something. You know, they'll mindlessly go their way following anyone or anything as they do what they do, and they'll get themselves into trouble all the time. It's just what they do, and it's what we do. Like, if you look at your life, if you look at your choices, the things you just do, the places where you find yourself, you know, I've heard it described this way. You ever, I don't know if any of you have long commutes. My previous career, I had long commutes. I'd be driving for an hour and a half to get somewhere. And you drive somewhere, and you're like, you've been driving for like 45 minutes for an hour, and you're like, I have no memory of the last 45 minutes. I just was going. And I think a lot of us have that in our lives. We, we actually don't even give, give thought to our nature, our character, or where we are, or what we're doing. And sometimes you can find that in life. You're like, how did I get here? What's going on? God knows you. He knows the way you were made because He created you. And He knows the problems that you face because He knows what sin did. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the brokenness in which you live. He knows what you were meant and made for. You know, that you were made to love him and and love each other and love yourself as you love others. Like, he knows that you're broken. He knows you. And he sees you. He sees you in your situation. He sees you in your story. He sees you in your hopes and in your dreams, your fears, your joys. You know, in verse 4, as Ezekiel's talking, right, he's like, you have not strengthened the weak, you haven't healed the sick, bound up the injured. He knows exactly what's happened to them. He sees them. You know, you haven't brought back the strayed. You ruled them harshly. I saw what you did to them. You know, he knows that they're scattered. He knows they're all over the place. He knows they're easy prey because he sees them. He knows exactly what's happening what they've been, what's been done to them and what they've done. You, know, you look at the, he talks to the fat and the sleek, right? The, the powerful, you know, sheep, not the shepherds, but even just within the sheep. He's like, I see you. I see what you've been doing. And I love and I know the people you've been doing it to. I see it and I see them. God sees you. Maybe you're here today and you feel unseen. I I think that's one of the biggest challenges. Like we post all kinds of stuff on Instagram, stuff on TikTok, look at stuff. But a lot of us walk through life feeling unseen and unknown. Like that's just where we live. You know, maybe you're, you're in school and you're like, nobody notices me. Would they even notice if I wasn't here? Do they even see me? Do they even see what I'm going through? Maybe you're in a marriage where you're like, does my spouse, does my husband, does my wife actually see me? Do they really see me? Do they see what's happened to me, what I'm going through? And God sees you. He sees you, 
and he loves you. Again and again throughout this passage, it's my sheep. He's mad at the leaders. It's because of what they've done to his sheep. You know, Jesus speaks in John 10, when, when John 10, 11, he's like, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And when he explains why he's the good shepherd, why he will do what he does, he says, I'm not a hired hand. Like the sheep don't belong to somebody else. They're my sheep. I care for them because they're mine. Because I love them. I know them, I see them, and I love them. That's who you are to God. Known, seen, loved. He knows everything about you. Sees everything in your story, and he loves you. Which, by the way, does not make sense. Like, I know for myself, that's not a natural progression. Let me, there's a, a TV show, this kind of shows you my age. When I was younger, I watched a TV show called Seinfeld. If you know what I'm talking about, you're really old, or you've maybe seen little clips on Instagram or TikTok or something, but it's like, there's this guy named George, and I, he works, he has this job, I think he's working for the Yankees baseball team, and, and the problem is that he doesn't actually do anything. He has no job, nobody knows who he is, nobody knows what he does, he just shows up and gets a paycheck. In fact, there's episodes that are largely connected with him just trying to hide. Like, he shows up at work and tries to find ways to hide under his desk and all this stuff problem is this, the boss wants to meet with him, you know, to, to give him a promotion or something, and he is petrified, he's like just losing it, and then his friend Jerry says to him, hey, what are you worried about, now you're going to get the recognition that you deserve, and he says, that's what I'm worried about, I think for most of us, if we knew that there was somebody who knew us, and could see us, like see us in our story, knows everything about us, knows everything that we do, sees everything we do, what we've done, what we've done to others, and we're like, he is going to love me. Uh, if you're here and you're thinking that, I, I just encourage you to look a little closer, because maybe you don't know yourself and you don't see yourself as you should. The fact of the matter is that when you look at yourself, when you, when you know yourself, when you see yourself, you're like, I am not worthy of anyone's love. I don't even want to be around myself when I think the things that I think, the thoughts that are in my mind, the things I do, the things I say. I mean, I got a pretty good batting average for people not knowing and seeing the stuff that I've done, which is good for me. If they knew everything, they would not love me. But God says, I love you. The gospel is that we're sinners not worthy of love, but God knows us, sees us, and he thinks we are worthy of his love. And not only that, he gave his own son Jesus for us. Jesus became one of us. God wrote himself into the story with Jesus, got down into the mess of this brokenness that we're in, and he gave his life for us. Like you mattered so much that Jesus became like you. Hebrews 2.17, like he became like his brothers and his sisters in every way except without sin. And that when you come to Jesus, when you see Jesus, you see someone who knows what you're going through. Who sees you and he sees what you're going through from the inside because he's also lived it. You come to a high priest who's not sympath is not unsympathetic to your plight. He knows you. He sees you. In fact, his son is your brother. And that brother, Jesus, went to the cross because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him might have life. That's the gospel. So the question for you is this. What if you knew, saw, and loved yourself as God does? You know, often we have all this negative stuff, right? 
We think about all the, like we've been talking about being known, being seen, how we're not worthy of love, and we kind of identify ourselves by that, right? I'm this, I've screwed up, I've committed adultery, I'm a liar, I'm, I'm, I'm just being passed over for promotions, I'm just middle level, I'm just, I'm just this, I'm just that, I'm just invisible, whatever it is. You just, you have all of this, this stuff about yourself that you know about yourself, and you identify yourself by it. And you bring that with you into all your relationships, everything you do, your, 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 like, your friendships. You're, like, you're always like, what do people see? What do I do? What do I do to make myself worthy of love, worthy of being seen? And, and somebody that somebody wants to know and see, you got all this stuff. And you look at yourself in terms of your, your mistakes, your embarrassment, your shames, your weaknesses. We see ourselves as lonely, hurt, afraid, abandoned, unknown, unseen, unloved. But that's not what God sees. Like the unmistakable gospel. If you haven't heard it before, hear it now. The gospel is that God knows you and sees you and loves you. That you are beloved by God in Christ. That's your identity. And what if you saw yourself? What if you saw yourself the way God sees you in Christ? And when you see Jesus, the Son of God, your brother, the one who took on our, our human nature, you see the God who knows, sees, and loves you. And you can spend your whole life trying to wrap your mind around that kind of love. The gospel is the story of what God did for his beloved. And the response to that is for you as a Christian to be loved. Like to just like to, to live in that love and to be defined, to be defined by it. Now the, we know that the apostle John wrote the gospel of John. Challenges, there's nowhere in the book where it actually says his name. We, the, the, he says, I am the disciple who wrote this, but he never gives his name. The only way he describes himself, the only way he defines himself is as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Think that through. He knew his name, and he knows that you're going to figure out his name, but the only thing he wanted you to know about himself, his identity, I was loved by Jesus. That defines us. To live in that being beloved. And what if you lived like that was true? And what, how would that change the way, not only you know, self-esteem and all that stuff, that, that's fine. But what, how would that change not only the way you viewed yourself, how would that change the way you entered into relationships with people, the way you did relationships, the way you dealt with good times and bad, that you would have this real and certain knowledge that God sees you, knows you, and loves you in Jesus Christ. He doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you as one washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. He sees you as magnificent. He sees you as radiant. He sees you as beautiful because of Jesus. And that means that when you go into relationships, you don't come as somebody who needs those relationships in order to be seen, to be known, or to be loved. You're, like, you're not a taker. Do you understand what I mean? Like, you have relationships where you're like, this person is just here because they want something from you. They take, they take, they take. I feel drained when I spend time with them. Because what they're doing is they're looking for something from you to make them something more. I need my husband to, to do this because then I feel worthy or I feel, I feel seen. And I, if I don't feel seen, then I am unable to love him. My, my wife... Needs to, needs to be like this. She needs to see me and appreciate me. And when she doesn't do that, then I just don't feel like I can return. Like, 
my friends, like if they aren't with me, if they don't know me, if they don't see me, I have a hard time interacting with them. But what if you entered into all of those relationships knowing the love that you have in Jesus Christ, the love of God that is there for you in Jesus, that you are beloved, that you then become a source of love. That you enter into relationships, marriages, family, school, wherever, and you are someone who is a source of love. Where you see people, where you know people, and you love them. And your self-worth, your identity is not based on what they say to you, but what you know is true because of Jesus Christ. When you think of Jesus, just see the love of God in the face of Jesus. Wherever you are right now, you are known, you are seen, you are loved. Jesus just the existence of Jesus tells you that. And his sacrifice on the cross says even more. But there's also a couple of other things. We can learn from the love of the good shepherd in his anger. Now think this through. What makes you angry? Like even this morning, what ticked you off? In my family... I think um, I heard one person refer to it as, as preparing our hearts for worship. It's getting everybody ready for church. That you're getting ready for church and you're yelling, where are you, where, where, get in the car. I told you to get in the car. And you're just losing it. Why are you angry? Well, because you want to show up on church on time. You've got something that you want to be able to do, all this stuff, right? You get angry. Sometimes you'll have it in your personal life that, that there's stuff that you, you get angry about that's kind of ugly, right? Like, I like sex, and if I don't have that part of my life satisfied, I get angry. I, I want money. I want recognition. I want, I want status. I want, I want people to like me. And if I don't get it, if something challenges that, I get angry. Anger can show your idols. If you're here right now and you want to identify your idols, what you worship, you just start making a list of the stuff that ticks you off the most. You will find your God. That's the negative side. But there's also a positive side to anger. Like if somebody does something to one of your kids or is threatening one of your kids or the, the wife or your husband that you love and you're like, somebody is like attacking them, somebody is trying to hurt them, anger is good. Like, you know, Paul says, in your anger do not sin, right? Anger in itself is not a sin, right? Anger is what love bleeds when it's cut. You have this love and you have justice and, you, and when you have something that you love, if it is attacked, if it's cut, like you bleed anger. You bleed anger. Like it's just what happens. And it has to. If nothing comes out, if, if you don't bleed anger when somebody hurts the one you love, and it's a good love, you got to question whether or not you actually loved. What makes God angry? What makes Him angry? Here in this passage, it's when His sheep, His beloved, are harmed. Like this whole passage is about, you know, about the, the, the leaders, the kings. He's, he's speaking against them. We'll, we'll talk about leadership in the teaching class, but... But it, it, a teaching uh, service, but it's like, but he is angry at what they've done. They were meant to be for the flourishing of the sheep. They were meant to lead and guide them and help them flourish and shine. In God's love for his people, he gave leaders, but they didn't do it. They actually made it worse, right? You see, as you go through the passage, again and again, God's talking about how, you know, you, you enriched yourself. You ruled them harshly. 
You, know, that you were supposed to care for them, but rather you trampled them. That's what he's saying throughout Ezekiel 34. He's like, I see you, and I'm angry. You know, he exiles the people of Israel. He causes the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple as an act of justice against his people for what they've done. But he's acting in an anger that flows from his love, justice and love. His voice shakes with anger against those who have harmed his beloved. You see his love and his anger. All the stuff that you might do when you think about what makes you angry in a negative way. And how powerful that anger can be in your life and how much it might even drive you. Know that God loves you and the anger He has makes your false anger, your sinful anger pale in comparison to its intensity. The creator of heaven and earth shakes with rage at what sin has done to His people. He knows, He sees, and He loves And in his love, he pursues justice. He doesn't compromise justice for love. He understands that justice is what comes from love when it's cut. And I I think the ultimate in being unknown and unseen is when something's happened to you and somebody dismisses it. Like maybe you're here today and you've experienced racism or you have been abused or you have been hurt. Somebody has taken something from you. And the deepest cut can actually be the second act, which is somebody coming up to you and saying, you know, you should just forgive And forget, because if you talk about this, it's going to hurt this person. So justice is then compromised for the sake of another. Like, it's not forgive because Jesus forgave and all that stuff. No, it's forgive because we want you to forget. We want you to act like it never happened because that's what Christians do. And that's not the gospel. That's the ultimate of being unseen. It compromises God's justice so that you, for the sake of something else. And that's the challenge with God's love for us. We brought sin into the world. We brought evil into the world. Sin needed to be paid for. Justice needed to be served. But God said, but I love them. I know them, I see them, and I love them. But for me to just ignore what they have done is to make me unjust, to be complicit in the face of evil. And I hate evil. How can I have the people I love And still have justice. And his answer was the cross. At the cross, God just unleashed his justice, his anger, his rage against sin and everything that he had done. He just poured it out on Jesus. I have no way of comprehending or even getting a a handle on it in terms of just my imagination even of, of what Jesus went through on the cross. That every sin, every shame, every guilt connected to my sins for all time. And the punishment that would undo it like it had never been there. Like think that through. If somebody's hurt you deeply, is there anything that they could do that would make you think? They are magnificent and they are beautiful. Not only did what they did not is something that that no longer stands between us, I see them as beautiful and magnificent. What would they have to do to do that? And what God said 
is the cross is the way I will do that. My son, the second person of the Trinity, God himself, will take my anger against sin and he will satisfy it. Because I love my people. I love them so much that I gave my own son. Even while we were enemies, God loved us and gave his son. So see God's love in his anger. See his love at the cross. And then finally, I'm just going to look at his love and his determination because it's the determination of the shepherd in Ezekiel 34, the determination of God that's really the, the star, Right? God's emphatic. He emphatically takes his sheep back from the shepherds. Verse 8, right? I myself will shepherd them. You're done. I'm taking them. I will shepherd them. Verses 11 through 16, he just describes what he's going to do, right? Like, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself, I will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in good pasture. He just goes on. I will search for the lost. I'll bring back... He just goes on and on about what he's going to do. He runs, he runs for his sheep. He's the opposite of the the lousy shepherds. God himself runs for his sheep. He pursues them into the mess they got themselves into, into the mess that was made worse by the leaders that were supposed to protect them. And he's speaking to them in Babylon, the place where they're in exile, the very place you would never imagine God to be able to speak his love to someone. Just think that through. The deepest, darkest, most lost place that you will ever find yourself. Maybe you've been there and you've experienced it. Maybe you're going to be there. And you're in this place where you feel so far from God. So unknown, so unseen, so unloved. See this image. God's determination. That if the gospel of Jesus Christ says anything to you, it says this. God is determined to save me from the mess that I'm in. And the farther I am from him, the more I know he's running to me. You know, that picture of the lamb in the pool of mud. As I said, it was in the offices of, say, families. And one of the, one of the, uh, the folks there was, was talking about it. And she said that somebody had come into their office, somebody who was just from a not faith, not from a church background, not from a faith background. And she just was like, and she looked at the image and she said, is the man a hunter? That's sad, right? Is the man a hunter? That, that in the middle of her brokenness, the first thing she thinks when she sees a a vulnerable lamb is that guy's out to get the lamb. The scandal of the determination of Jesus Christ to save us. That anybody else sees that image and a Christian knows that's Jesus. Like I could show that picture to you and if you've known Jesus for a long time or even for a relatively short time, you're like, that's Jesus. And that's an awesome picture. But when you don't know Jesus, that's a hunter. It's a commentary on God as the good shepherd. It's a commentary on sheep, on us. That to see someone running towards us with such intentionality would be something to fear. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is that picture, is beautiful. That your Savior is running for you. The God who knows you and who sees you, sees everything you've been through and who loves you. The creator of the universe, the most powerful being in the universe, the one who called the universe into being. He's running for you. He's pursuing you. He's doing it out of unspeakable love. 
and pursuing you with intentionality. Jesus, the Son. Jesus, the Son of God. You know, Isaiah 53, like a, like a, like a lamb led to the slaughter. He's being slapped, spit upon, punched in the face, whipped, mocked, nailed to a cross, carrying our sin and shame, carrying our sin and shame, scorning it. Running through the justice that God unleashed on him for us. Just running it, taking the blows, just undeterred, just running through it all. Blow after blow that would take him down and he does not fall. He keeps running because he will get to his goal. He is determined, I myself will save them. That Jesus, as you see, you can read it maybe this afternoon sometime. John 10, 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. They don't belong to somebody else. They're my sheep, and I will save them. I am determined to. That's the good shepherd. It's the one spoken of throughout Scripture. Spoken of by David, Psalm 23. I think we're going to sing it in a second. The one spoken of by Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, and by Ezekiel. So be loved in Christ. Learn from the love of the good shepherd. You know, we'll talk more about, you know, if you're going to be here at the teaching service or you catch it later, whatever you do, but like there's more when it comes to just the implications of what that means for how you interact with people, but, but just for who you are and your self-understanding and what it means for how you interact with other people. See the love of Jesus Christ. See God's love for you in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 31 to 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. You are known, you are seen, you are beloved. So be loved. And may that love form you and define you and give you a boldness and a courage and a peace and a strength that you could not imagine you could have where you become just this transformative presence even in your own relationships that not only does this love of God change you but you live that love out and you change others that the gospel is something that not only is internalized but then shines out from you let's pray Father in heaven thank you for your son Thank you for seeing us. Thank you for, for just knowing us and seeing us and loving us. And pray, Father, that you would be with, be with those who are here today who are struggling with being unknown and unseen and unloved. May they see the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. May they see your love in Jesus. And may they open wide their arms to embrace that love. May it define them. And Father, would you also make this community a place that follows the good shepherd who, who knows the people around them, who see the people around them, and who love the people around them with the love with which God loved them. And we pray, Father, that, that this identity that we have in Jesus Christ, that it would persist in the middle of whatever we're going through. And Father, if there's people here right now who are feeling like they are so far from you, that it would be impossible for you to love them. Would you, by the power of your spirit, by your determination, your unrelenting love and grace and justice, would you just break through that and pull them to yourselves, that they would know the goodness of God, that they would know the beauty of your love in Jesus Christ. Father, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.